I have to, I have to share with you that we are doubly grateful for the presence of the director, Pavel Pavlikovsky, because he was originally supposed to fly into New York this evening to be at the New York Film Critics. He flew in yesterday in order to be with us tonight, but got stuck in a connecting flight situation, developed a terrible cold, arrived at Newark Airport this morning, deaf in one ear from all of this, <laughs> and still managed to come to be with this audience. So, thank you. <laughs> And I'm just going to ask if we can raise the house lights just a little bit because we see you as this black void and I always prefer for a slight visibility if it's possible. That's slightly better. I'm going to start off and keep your voice strong yeah. um, with a question about casting because to me so much of the greatness of the film resides in these two performances in particular. And I'm going to start with Agata Kulesha because she has won the Best Supporting Actress Prize from the LA Film Critics. And I understand that she's more of a stage actress, although she does film. And I'm curious, what led you to her? Uh, I was, you know, this, in that age bracket, you know, there's not too many unknowns, you know, so we, we knew where to look. And there were three or four actresses who were clearly good and one who was brilliant. And, uh, and I went to see her in a play. I'd seen her in films, but they were not films I liked particularly, so I couldn't really judge her acting from, from seeing her in, in, in films. But when I saw her at Theatre at Ateneum, uh, playing, strangely, an alcoholic uh, as well, she did it so subtly and so gracefully uh, that, uh, and then I met her, she was brilliant. She was, she was a very strong character, wonderful sense of humor, wit. I, I could tell she's, she's it very quickly. So I didn't do any auditions or anything. I just kind of cast that was it. blind. Yeah. I gather she was also, um, Dancing with the Stars exists in Poland as well as the United States. She was actually, in 2008, the celebrity contestant. She won and was the first celebrity to give all of her prize to charity, if I understand she correctly. a Porsche away to a charity. Like. Voila. And why do I, I mean, mention... the roads in Poland, you know, were not up, up, to, up to it anyway, so... But yeah, she's, uh, she's, that's made her very, very popular in Poland. Well, I mention this partly because I was not familiar with this actress when I saw the film the first time. And then, uh, recently, I actually saw a Polish film called In Hiding, which was made about two years ago. And she was so radically different. She smiles. She's younger and warmer. And I realized that she's much younger than what I thought the actress and character of Wanda were, and she's extremely versatile. Now, if you could tell us it's a little also bit... working with me ages actors, you know? <laughs> that just yeah. On the other hand, you have Agata Czebuchowska, and if I understand correctly, she had never acted before the yeah. film playing Ida. And could you just tell us a little about how you found her? Well, it was after, after uh, looking for a very long time uh, among actors or ac acting students all over Poland and not finding anyone who I could believe would be that character. And the character is very unusual, so it wasn't, it was very underwritten, the character. Well, it was under, under everything, as you probably saw. Uh, but I, I needed somebody who could really embody that quality, uh, that very strong... Um, grounded um, uh, character who can listen and doesn't speak before she thinks and, and is able to observe. So in the end, after months and months of looking, I asked all my friends in, 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 in Poland to just keep looking everywhere because I was, you know, time was running out. We had no, uh, uh, no uh, not many options left. Uh, and a friend of mine, um, who's a Polish director, Małgosia Szumowska, rang me from a cafe in Warsaw, I was actually in Paris at the time, and said, there is this girl sitting across the table from me in a cafe, and I don't know what you're looking for, but she looks interesting. <laughs> and I said, take this photograph on your iPhone, if you have one, and, and send it to me. And she sent it to me, and I got her look nothing like what I was looking for. She had a lot of makeup, and she was like a typical Warsaw hipster. Uh, but she did look interesting, so uh, so I said, okay, I have nothing to lose. Let's let's you know try and approach her. Let's meet her. Uh, by which time uh, Agata Szybowska left the cafe, and we had to then contact the barman and a 
it was quite a roundabout <laughs> way. But finally, I, I came to Warsaw, uh, I met her, and she was nothing like on the photograph. She was actually, when we took off her makeup and all the, you know, not, not everything, but uh, she was actually a very serious, thoughtful, uh, brilliant woman. Uh, and, and one s striking thing she said immediately is that she's a total atheist. You know? And secondly, that she doesn't want to act. And <laughs> so perfect, you know, that's like, oh, okay. we've got, we've got, the, we've got the, the right actress. And then I did a few auditions with her just to see how she bears under pressure with the saxophonist, David Ogrodnik, and with Agatha. And the young Agatha bears under bore pressure very well. She, because, because she's basically strong, you know, she's, uh, she was herself uh, all the time. Uh, but within being herself, you could still manipulate her. You know, you could change the rhythm. You could, uh, you know, get her into the flow of a scene. Uh, and above all, she's really intelligent. So she questioned. Uh, she asked all the right questions about the character. And once, uh, once she got it in her head, you know, who, who this is, um, she, she was she was totally inside. So, so suddenly I had these two, two actresses, one incredibly experienced, virtuoso, who can play all sorts, and, uh, and Vanda is all sorts. I mean, there's a lot of personalities lurking in Vanda. And the other one who's, who stays more or less the same, although she does develop. And, and it's clear that something in her is happening, because, uh, because I mean, something's happening in, in Ida and also in, in Agatha, who plays her. She's a very intense, thoughtful creature. Uh, so, but the relationship of these two actresses, one who acted and the other one who doesn't want to act, uh, you know, was kind of re reflected <laughs> the situation in the film quite well. And now that young Agatha has made this film and been acclaimed, is she continuing to act or has this been a one-shot deal for her? No, she was, she's not interested in acting. So yeah. she's not doing it she anymore? She finished her studies uh, and now she's, she might direct, you know, I mean, she was really interested in the process. Uh, but she's more interested in documentaries at the moment than, than in, in... I mean, she's doing her own thing, you know, it's, which is uh, nice to see. Um, and, and acting, and she's not a histrionic character. She doesn't have to be noticed or at the center of attention. She likes to observe and to, to dictate what she does in her own time and do what she wants to do, you know, so... And it worked for the part. She, yeah. Now, and, and if she's interested in documentary, that mirrors <coughs> what I told the audience earlier was your original formation in Britain. Um, but then you, you wrote a script for this film, and I'm curious because you're obviously not just bilingual. We happen to know that this director speaks about six languages fluently, but okay, for the moment, the script for Ida, you co-wrote it with Rebecca Lenkiewicz. Mm -hmm. She is a, a, a playwright in London. She wrote this um, play, Ophelia and Company, which is about um, Shakespeare's heroines in crisis. Um, and did you write the first draft in Polish and then work with her in English, or did you write it in English and then translate to Polish? Uh, I wrote the first draft in Polish. It was a slightly different story then. You know, there the were, uh, you know, the, the, the different Ida was a bit different then, and I've been fooling around with this for eight years, so there have been many permutations. Uh, but I, I kind of, I, you know, for me, uh, script is a kind of necessary evil. I don't take the script too seriously, generally, so I kind of know that whatever we write to get the finance and to get the thing more or less in shape, I will still submit it to my process of just writing and rewriting uh, in terms of just, just in terms of what happens in the process in my head, you know, because for me, making films, documentaries and fictions is, is a bit of a, like a psychoanalysis, you know, I mean, a lot of stuff comes out in the process when you're doing it, when you expose yourself to, to the kind of reality of the film and to the actors, and even looking for actors makes you realize stuff that you didn't quite uh, think of when you're writing. Uh, looking for locations, you know, especially I spend a lot of time looking for locations and driving around looking for locations makes you th relive your film differently. Things that occur to you while, while, that happen to you, that occur to you while you're preparing, it all impacts on the film. Even rehearsals, 
uh, our kind of thinking time and shaping time. For me, you know, making film is, is a kind of sculpting process and writing is just one of the many elements in it. So for me, the most important thing is the first, the idea, the outline, the, the 20 pages, uh, um, the beginning, middle and an end, more or less. The, act, the, the characters, usually you have three characters in all my films, you know, who kind of want something from each other in some interesting way. And just gathering of, put, putting on layers and layers into the, into the thing, you know, just kind of enriching the thing in order then to strip it down. So I, there's never a point where I think, oh, this is a great script, now I just have to go and shoot it, you know. Uh, there is a moment where the script is kind of showable to financiers and I know I'm going to change half of it at least. Of course, good lines will stay and good situations will stay, but the main thing is to feel that the characters are rich, that they are uh, complicated, paradoxical, uh, and give actors something to do, give me something to work around, and that the through line is, is good, has layers, uh, that there's a kind of transcendent thing to the whole, to the whole, to the whole film. So once I know that in my bones, and you know, I have it on paper, then I kind of know I can l plunge into a film even with 15 pages of treatment. You know? uh, and the whole kind of writing and rewriting is just thinking time, and it's kind of a massing of materials. Sometimes, you know, great lines occur, which you then keep, and they stay to the end. Um, but very often, you know, the, the script you go to get your finance from, I know that there's so much stuff that's just kind of approximate and provisional, that it just kind of has to get you from A to B, there are even some characters who I know I'll get rid of once I actually start making the film, but they're useful to you know, give information to the readers and make them feel like they understand the film. Um, so for me, it's a kind of like a never-ending fluid process, which is exactly how I used to make my documentaries, you know, because my documentaries were not exactly documentary either. You know, they, were, they were not verite documentaries. They were, to some degree, constructed. Uh, and kind of lived and worked through and edited, re-edited, reshot, not reshot, but on the basis of my first assembly, I kind of went and shot a bit more. So I always try to keep that kind of open-minded, fluid approach in, I, I, as far as possible with, with, you know, with production uh, requirements and with financiers. Um, I try to keep that, uh, 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 that open and, and alive. Um, and this is, for me, what the exciting thing about filmmaking is, you know, and I can even change the character. If I find a, a great, great creature or person uh, to act uh, out a role, I can even tweak, uh, tweak that role or even change it. You mentioned earlier, before the curtain went up, a film I did called The Woman in the Fifth, where there's a character played by Joanna Kulik, the pop singer in the, in the film here. In Ida, she's the one who does the numbers like Jimmy Jones would have. And I met, I met Joanna uh, for a completely different film like six years ago, uh, for which she was totally ill-suited, but she was so great that I thought, I've got to okay, I'll, I'll create a part for her in this film, which you probably haven't seen, The Woman in the Fifth. And then I kind of created this part for her as well, because I knew she could sing. So very often, you know, my, my work is just falling in love with elements, not, not just women, by the way. Um, uh, just, just, you know, locations, you know, there's some kind of landscapes that I, I keep going back to. Um, and literature is just part of a bigger thing, bigger picture. Yeah. I mean, I, what I remembered after seeing Ida for the first time was not the dialogue at all. It was even not just the faces of the women. It was that very often you place the camera so low that, I, I know I'm not the first person to mention this, that they are so low in the frame that you become very aware of all the space on top of them. So that each shot becomes for me almost meditative, like I have to think about it. And I remember when I first saw the film with my husband, you know, we were thinking at the end, is it because the characters are so far from heaven? Is it because maybe that space represents murdered Jews whose absence sort of hangs over them? You know, and when I first mentioned this mm -hmm. to you, you kind of smiled. Mm -hmm. The same way Kishlovsky used to smile when I would hazard my interpretations on him and he would say, whatever you think is okay. <laughs> um, but you, know, you obviously started a visual strategy with Ida 
that's consistent from beginning to end, including I know some of us kind of laughed when we saw the subtitles on top of the frame, because if you had them on the bottom, we wouldn't be able to see the faces. So if you could just tell us a little about that process. <coughs> well, the, I mean, the, the, the basic uh, intention before the framing uh, emerged, this eccentric kind of off-center, Framing. It, it was that I, I wanted to shoot it uh, as far as what, black and white, four by three, to strip it down, to simplify it, to not to show too much. Um, but also I wanted to shoot ideally each scene from one angle only, without moving the camera, to cr just to have strong concentrated shots, which wouldn't just be kind of beautiful shots, you know, separate from action. There'd be shots where action and image and acting and emotion coincide. So that I knew from pretty early on, that I wanted a film that's meditative as well as, as just, uh, you know, as a story, storytelling film. Um, and then, uh, and not to move the camera and not to have too coverage. Of course, I've got, I've got some reverses here, but not, not too many. Um, and and, and the, the idea was to limit, you know, to, and to suggest as much as possible by showing as little as possible. Uh, and then, but once I've, uh, you know, uh, settled on this four by three and uh, not moving the camera, uh, and then I just thought, how do we create some tension in this image, you know? And, and very often, four by three is, is a great format for portraits or, or double portraits. But sometimes in wider shots, it was like, oh, you know, it's a little bit like square and, and it's boring. Uh, so uh, at some point, point and already rehearsing with the camera, just trying to find placements in the car in that Wartburg that you saw. I said, what happens if we just tilt it up and have more, you know, headroom? And suddenly it looked interesting and, and kind of uh, like nerve, nervous or nervy, edgy. Uh, so I said, okay, let's keep doing that and see, see where we get. And then we started doing it for real, you know, more and more and got more, more crazy with it. And then it was too late to stop. <laughs> Uh, and it kind of worked all the time, although at times, you know, I kind of woke up and said, what are we doing, you know? <laughs> this is, um, uh, especially when, uh, then, then the, it occurred to me that the film might have distribution abroad and need subtitles, and then what? You know, everything happens at the bottom. Um, but then the film was sort of dictating, you know, once you settle on so many kind of uh, stylistic decisions, uh, then at some point the film just, directs itself, you know, including the framing. You just kind of know, well, this is not, this is wrong, this is bland. We have to try this, you know, okay. Um, and, and not just with the framing, with everything, you know, like dialogue suddenly just jumped out, you know, it sounded good in rehearsal and suddenly it just doesn't feel good anymore at all, so let's just kind of think quickly. Um, so at some point the film was just kind of, you know, following through its own logic and I was, I was just avoiding false steps, you know. Well, and you, framing was part of that. And you mentioned once that um, we're so used to seeing in movies a character in a horizontal landscape, tiny, sort of lost horizontally. Yeah. And I think you said that in this, they're lost vertically. Yeah. And there's a sense of how forlorn the character could be because yeah. of the composition. Yes, and, and of course, uh, you know, the reason why it did feel right when we first tried to frame like that, it was because there is a kind of vertical quality to the film, and, and, uh, and I don't want to intellectualize about that too no. much. But. I mean, look, it, it begins in a convent, and if there's anything that defines the life of a nun, it would be the prayer, you know, the ascent, both A-S-C-E-N-T and ascent, A-S-S-E-N-T, you know, the acceptance of, you know, your head to God, and in a way, the camera strategy is, is very effective. Although I must admit that um, last year, I met the actor David Ogrodnik, who plays the saxophonist. I was with Hanna Hartovich, who runs the New York Polish Film Festival here. We met him, and I said to him, what was it like, I asked, for an actor in that situation? And he said, Can, I'll tell you the truth. He goes, I was so uncomfortable. He said, I was so aware of all this space above my head, and he told me that he came to you and said, couldn't we try something so that I can move in and out of the frame? And you said, well, we can try it. But then it didn't work. At the end of the conversation, though, he admitted that finally when the cast and crew sat down to watch mm. the finished film, 
they all realized what they had been part of, which they didn't quite realize while shooting, because that was your vision. And there was a coherence from beginning to end that had nothing to do with how comfortable an actor felt about being able to move. It had something else that was taking place. Mm. But actors do suffer when they feel that camera is as important as, as their <laughs> performance and emotion. And so it's a, it's a toss-up in films. Always. Of course, of course. And by the way, you, you, the black and white cinematography of this film has been universally acclaimed. But I understand that you cut out scenes from the film because you thought they were too pretty. Not scenes. Or, or shots. But we, I, I, we did shoot a few shots which were just two clearly beautiful shots. Uh, but because they didn't have action in them, uh, I could easily cut them out. You know, they were just part of a sequence. So the film didn't suffer from not having them dramatically, it didn't suffer. Uh, but also they were self-conscious, you know. That I did want to keep a balance between uh, the, you know, the performance, the actors, the emotions, and, and the image. So, it should, so the image would never just be there for its own sake. Um, and uh, on a couple of occasions there were these great spectacular shots which were just like, oh, they were clearly wrong. The same as in, a, in a, you know, when you're mixing, you know, sometimes we had just too many sound effects. Or, you know, but, but when you have a film that's so stripped down, it, it, it clearly rejects stuff, you know, so, uh, so, so I didn't suffer too much cutting them out. For example, and I'm, I, I think I know the answer here, but any Hollywood director, and I know this is not a Hollywood film, would have shown Vanda driving the car into a ditch. Mm -hmm. And you have an ellipsis. She's clearly not quite looking at the road and suddenly mm. there are horses pulling the car out of the ditch. So you never shot that. I did. You, that's what I was quite honest, I did, I lost my nerve and it was in the script and it was so blatantly wrong. <laughs> it just was so lame as well. And we didn't have the technology to do it well anyway, but that's, you know, that's beside the point. Uh, and, you know, so very quickly, it just was like, why, you know, why are we doing this shot? You know, this is just clearly... But that was like early on in the film, you know, so I was still tempted. And I, and I wasn't sure that ellipsis would, would work, by the way. And when I showed it to some people at the beginning, they said, oh, what the hell, what's going on? Uh, it only works because, I, because the viewer is already kind of in the cut that, that you've seen. Because the viewer is already trained to look in a certain way. You know, so from the very beginning, when you kind of train the viewer not to expect to be guided, you know, they start kind of entering the film differently and supplying all the, you know, the, the missing links themselves. Sure. Now you mentioned but when I was shooting sorry. it, I wasn't totally, you know, uh, uh, you know, totally convinced it would work. You know, I was hoping and you know, praying, but. Uh, yeah. Well, personally, I love ellipses like that because it makes me work harder. You know, I like when a film invites me to participate in the unraveling of the action. You don't just feed me and I absorb it like a sponge. I have to go, oh, she drove off the road and I have to almost picture it for myself, which pu pushes me into the action more than seeing the external manifestation yeah. of something. Now, you mentioned a few minutes ago an intriguing term that when you make a film, you're kind of psychoanalyzing yourself. And I did want to raise an issue because I know that your paternal grandmother, mm -hmm. you found out late in life was Jewish mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that she died in Auschwitz. And I was wondering if you could tell us when you found that out and whether you believe that informs a film like Ida. Mm, well, inevitably it does, but it wasn't what I meant by psychoanalysis. You know, it was a piece of information that I, uh, what I knew, I had a Jewish you know, ancestry on my father's side um, from my late or oh, mid-teens onwards. Uh, the fact that she died in Auschwitz, it was a surprise because I, I looked through some paperwork of my father's and I thought, oh, place of death? Auschwitz. Oh, that's surprising. He never told me, so he didn't want, yeah, for whatever, whatever reasons. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but, I, but you know, it's what more interesting, though, know, the character of, of Vanda, who has, like, my father's sense of humor, you know, like, it was more that kind of thing, like, intuitive, you know, looking for the familiar, looking for, you know, when I found locations or shots, I was constantly 
just trying to react to, to something uh, that's somewhere there, you know, that's in the memory, that it's some kind of nostalgia for some world, that lost world. Um, when I look for faces of extras, you know, they all kind of hand-picked extras, it took ages to find each one, but they had to ring a bell, you know, there has to be something that's like something either that's, you know, in my, uh, something I've seen or I remember, or it's in my dreams. Um, Vanda's sense of timing and sense of humor, that's totally my, my father's. Um, you know, constantly you, you look intuitively for the familiar, you know, when it comes to framing, even the lighting or the, the actor you like, you know, what, you know, for me the most interesting about most our directors I like is how they cast their films. That's incredibly revealing, you know, who do they cast in their films? You know, some directors I don't have a feeling for because they don't cast actors that I would ever consider worth casting. Um, but it's just like, you know, when I see films that I, of directors I like, um, I just feel that these films are made with that kind of, psychoanalysis is not the wrong word, but the search for the familiar, you know, so this kind of like looking for something. Um, some and kind of nostalgia. Would that also have been the case because you had, you left Poland when you were 14 and had been living in other parts of Europe. So this was your first return when you were making Eva. Yeah. So was it that you were also finding either images or sounds, music, no, that reminded song. you of when you were a child in Poland in 1962? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, the pop songs are all songs I, I, I listened to as a four, five, six year old, you know. And I remember the, the lyrics uh, really, really well. Um, the images, the, the type of car in the film, you know, it's, it's all kind of steeped in, in, in some kind of nostalgia, of course, yeah. But, uh, you know, I've been going back to Poland uh, ever since the you know, late 70s, 80s. So it's not like I, you know, separated from Poland, but, but doing Ida's return to Poland, but also return to a period which I did you know, experience in some kind of, uh, you know, intense way, because when you're, when you're that age, five, six, seven, you still don't interpret the world, you know, nothing is familiar and conceptualized, you know, so you see things for the first time or hear them, and they really stick, you know, so, uh, so there is that in the film, it's a kind of return to a certain period, yeah. Uh, reminds me of a beautiful line of Jean Cocteau, a child's eyes take a picture, Later, he develops the film. So, in a way, that's that. Um, I'm going to ask you because you, you just used the word return, and I can't help but, now that <coughs> I got you here, ask about the ending of this film because I was not really prepared for Ida returning to the convent. I'm not sure what I was prepared mm -hmm. for because this was a film that had a lot of openness to it. Jim Hoberman, who wrote beautifully about this movie, he asked about the open ending, has the protagonist in any way experienced herself as a Jew? Does she understand what it means to be a Christian? Will she be one of the Carmelite nuns who located their convent in Auschwitz? What lessons, if any, has she taken from her few weeks of living in the world? I don't expect you to answer the questions because heaven knows if a director could do that, he wouldn't make a movie. But do you feel, did you envision a life for the character after this film is over. I mean, do you have a sense of what you believe Ida would be continuing with? In, pra in practical terms? Not terribly. I mean, she definitely doesn't need the world. And she goes uh, back to, to God in a, kind of, in a, in a, in a most uh, general sense. Um, whether she goes back to the convent is, an, uh, is another matter. Um, but she's a very extraordinary creature. I mean, she's, she's not... Uh, so a lot of people think, is this the lesson of the film? No, it's, there's no lesson in the film. I mean, she's a very extraordinary character, you know, psychologically, sociologically unusual. So she was, you know, a, a certain type of believer at the beginning, but she is imbued with God, you know, whether it doesn't mean that she's, you know, ca Catholic in a kind of tribal sense, I mean, she, she definitely has a sense of, of, of God about her. And then she discovers the world, falls in love with her aunt, tries to, and misses her aunt when the aunt, you know, because her aunt was like energy, was like great, great presence, and, and a very lovable, troubled creature. So obviously she kind of, she went out, first rejected her, then kind of embraced her, then the aunt 
goes missing, um, she tries to understand the aunt's world and enter, enter her shoes, literally. And, uh, and then she realizes she doesn't, you know, what the world has to give her is not enough, you know. And, uh, but the way she exits the film is she's a different person from the person who entered it. So. Well, when I saw Ida, I couldn't help but think of a real person, uh, Romuald Wexler, Wexler Vaschio. Mm -hmm. I've seen two films about him. This is an extraordinary man who, um, I mean, to get all the details exactly right, he was a Polish priest who discovered that he was born to Jewish parents when he was 35, meaning 12 years after he was ordained. He was a professor of philosophy at the Catholic University of Lublin. And this documentary that I saw two years ago called Torn, it traces his rather courageous journey to Israel at the age of 67, where he tries to master Hebrew and also practicing Judaism while not disavowing his Catholicism. Um, in other words, he, and the first film I saw about him was The Cross Inscribed in the Star of David, a short film where you see that he actually wears the cross inscribed in the Star of David. He never rejected either part of his heritage, though he was a practicing priest. Mm. Were you familiar with his story? And forgive me when I ask, do you think that Ida might have become something like him? But Ida is no intellectual. She wouldn't have been a lecturer at Lublin okay. Catholic University. <laughs> gotcha. But I did hear about his story. I didn't. I haven't explored it. But the idea of a of a, a Catholic priest who discovers uh, that he's Jewish definitely had something was like something to do with the with the germ of of, of the Ida character for sure. I tried not to find out anything about him because I was already on a different trip with Ida, um, but. Uh, yeah, but she's not, uh, she's not, uh, she doesn't verbalize, you know, it's a, it's a, or, or conceptualize. It's a slightly different, um, different character. Okay. No, she, I mean, and, and it's even visually that she's a tabula rasa. In other words, that, that pale skin of hers, there's a sort of clarity and, and one can project more onto her face yeah. than what necessarily can be visualized by her. Um, I was interested, I mean, we know that Ida is the official entry from Poland for the Best Foreign Language Film Oscar. It has been shortlisted. So we know that the film has been embraced by the country where it was made. And I was curious about what were the reactions of Polish audiences when the film was released and whether, for example, it was the same in urban or rural areas. And in fact, when I went to Poland this past summer in July, I was at the Museum of the History of Polish Jews mm. in Warsaw, an extraordinary place, which almost coexists with the film Ida on a contemporary <coughs> spectrum of a new awareness of the combined history of Christian Poles and Jewish Poles. They had just played Ida mm -hmm. at the museum. And I was also wondering, you know, what kind of reaction the film had there compared mm. to in other parts of Poland? Well, it was uh, critically brilliant, you know, and it won all possible awards. Uh, it wasn't a mass uh, audience that came to see the film because it seemed like it's an austere black and white film. And there have been several films on the issue of Polish-Jewish relations. So people said, oh, another one of those. Um, so it wasn't like a hugely embraced by the masses, let's say. but. Um, but the kind of 120,000 cinephiles that went to see it liked it, <laughs> but it was only 120,000. Um, though I, I got some kind of nationalists who, who were, you know, irritated by, oh, again, you know, and where are the Germans in this whole story, you know, why? I mean, there's another po Polish peasant who kills Jewish family. You know. So, you know, they saw the, uh, but they were like small minority, who, but noisy, but small. Um, uh, and then I had uh, some, uh, I, I haven't read it, but there was apparently an article by uh, uh, some intellectual left-wing journalist who said that it's an anti-Semitic film because, uh, because what, because Wanda uh, is a Stalinist judge of Jewish origins and that's a bit of a cliche and I'm sort of pandering to that. Um, and then, uh, and then at, at, at another screening, some nationalist, you know, Paul, who said you made an anti-Polish film, said, you know, how could you make a Stalinist 
Jewish woman so likable. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, there was a lot of, you know, there's always kind of people who would like you to have made a different film. Um, in France, I had some you know, reactions from, uh, from secular feminists who said, you know, how could you put the veil on a woman in your film at the end? I, so, yeah, so the film frustrates a lot of, um, a lot of um, people, but perhaps the majority way. seem yeah. to go with it. Yeah. And, I mean, did you, perhaps in any previous draft, ever have not necessarily a Nazi, um, but an inclusion of the fact that any Christian Pole who was found to hide a Jew during World War II faced the death penalty? I mean, did you ever consider putting that in just to make the, the story, shall we say, not just Polish, Jewish, yeah. Polish, Catholic, but in fact. But, but I tried to make a film that's about, about a historical situation, but not to make it a, a film ab about history. Um, I tried to make it like a meditation that's a bit more timeless. And I've noticed every time I try to put information into the dialogue, suddenly the film, uh, Collapsed, you know. Suddenly, it was like a different, slightly more didactic, uh, explanatory film. So, um, so I know I wasn't. Well, of course, in, in some version, I tried to put as much information as possible, which I then kind of stripped, stripped back because I thought you can't explain everything. You know, you can't. So I just opted for this, you know, for this slightly. Uh, abstract approach where we float above the ground a bit rather than uh, just really kind of explain things, uh, knowing that, that a lot of people would be frustrated by that. Even though there's a scene in the, in, in the grave where, where Felix, the, the, the son of Shimon, digs up the, the bones where I had Felix in, in one version explain why he did what he did. Uh, and uh, just like in four sentences, and he, what he explained was that Shimon, his father, was um, harbored the family, Lebensteins, because, because partly because he was in love with Ida's mother. So when Shimon re sees Ida in the hospital, he says, Ruja. Yeah. Uh, and, and, the, and Felix, who was then a 16, 17 year old boy, was really angry about that because. Uh, because harboring a Jewish family meant a possible death sentence. You know, I mean, it, was, it was automatic death if you were found. Uh, so, and, and then he kind of explains that in f four sentences. But suddenly, it's a different film. You know, it becomes like the music of the film is lost. Suddenly, the story of Felix and Shimon becomes incredibly interesting, and like a separate, different film. And. Uh, I thought, actually, you know, it was a difficult decision, but um, but I decided not. I decided to cut it where I cut it. You know, where he just says, um, "I did it," uh, and then he explains why he did it. Uh, but it was a permanent, uh, like a balancing act between what do we explain and how do we make a film that feels like more than a historical film that explains stuff. Uh, I mean, uh, I have to admit that even asking the question, yeah. I'm not comfortable because anyone who's just watched Ida knows that it's far more poetry than history or sociology. I mean, it, it is a work that has formalist vision that, you know, is absolutely coherent with the story. And there are documentaries that, that there have been so many documentaries the already books. that deal with. There's one opening January 16th at the Quad Cinema that I just saw from Poland yeah. called The Touch of an Angel. It's an interview and a, a very poetic film, actually, about Henrik Schenker, who uh, was originally from Oświęcim, from Auschwitz, and his father was head of the Jewish community there. The only reason I'm mentioning this is because at the end of the film, he actually makes the claim that no Polish Jew could have survived the Holocaust unless there was a Christian helping him or her. Mm. It's, a, it's a big statement and one that is open to debate as well but it's the other side of the Shimon Felix story. Mm -hmm. And one that you know, is part of this constantly evolving discussion within Poland and beyond about but, history. But what I was trying to do, by just by being 
like, like visual and concrete, is to show what happens to Felix, for example, in that grave. I mean, the man is destroyed, he collapses, you know. I wanted to, um, not to explain and not to judge from outside, but I wanted everybody to carry their own, to carry their own burden and for that to be seen uh, physically, like visually. And that was, that was what the film was trying to do. Um, so. And that I understand. Yeah. And in a moment, we're going to take some questions from you as well, but I feel very obligated to ask one on behalf of some of my students who are in the room tonight. We just watched in Polish cinema history many great films, and we became increasingly aware that it, it ain't just Kishla, <coughs> obviously, and Vida, but the person about whom I'm currently writing a book, Wojciech Haas, whose films are less known than the others, but he made the Saragossa Manuscript and the Hourglass Sanatorium. We watched a film called How to Be Loved, mm -hmm. in which uh, the character suddenly has jumped out a window. Um, we watched The Noose, his first feature, mm -hmm. which is the story of an alcoholic and the last 24 hours of his life, basically, from a story by Marek Huasco. And when I saw Ida, I just felt this continuity mm -hmm. between this early work of Haas and you. And I was just curious if you could maybe, for my students here, um, I, elaborate if there's anything there. There's, I mean, there's no uh, continuity as such. I knew Haas's famous films, you know, the, the Saragossa Manuscript and the Hourglass Sanatorium. I've only just discovered his other films on YouTube, strangely. <laughs> They're all available on uh, YouTube, but without subtitles. The one I'm totally in love with is Farewells. Beautiful, film, beautiful. And, and I realize he's a completely un unrecognized genius. You know, he's probably the most talented Polish director uh, since the war, with his own sensibility, vision. I mean, Vida is the most famous, he's a, he's a brilliant director, but Vida very much depends on materials, on the books, on on kind of literary uh, um, um, sources, you know, whereas there's something about Haas that is very kind of original and unique and specific only to him. Well, it's also what you just said about Ida compared to the other films I was raising. Vaida, if you've seen Ashes and Diamonds or Canal, Promised Land, Man of Marble, Man of Iron, there's a romantic vision of history, past and present. There's a sense of a national destiny and Haas could not have cared less about history. I mean, he made films about quirky individuals and they were very rigorous formally, much like Ida. But you can find out much more about history that way. I mean, it's fun, strangely. <laughs> uh, because, you know, very often when films is about history, it's already tendentious in some way. It already sets the whole question up in a certain way which implies its own answer. Uh, whereas being more psychologically complex and formally uh, consistent, uh, you can actually convey all sorts of things by the way uh, uh, and, uh, and not lay yourself bare to somebody saying exactly the opposite. Ida is not only, I think, a gem in its own terms, but part of a much larger and fruitful discussion of history, but also of the future, hopefully with Polish, Jewish, Christian relations improving. Thank you so much for coming with us. <laughs> We're gonna go next door. There's a reception waiting for us, but. Thank you.